Today we want to highlight 7 of the most revolutionary technologies or cornerstones that pushed the world of CGI to what it is today, especially in the last couple of decades. Trust me, if you stick around, you will learn at least a couple of things. Now we're going to talk about something really important, which is using GPUs in CGI. The introduction of GPUs to the computer graphics industries was probably as monumental as the human race invented the wheels. So, GPU rendering opened up so many possibilities for computer graphics, as it heavily accelerated many tasks compared to using the CPU. And just for comparison, GPUs nowadays have thousands of cores. An RTX 3090 has over 10,000 cores, while CPUs have only up to 64. In general, CGI is based on stuff that you can usually split up into smaller units like pixels, in addition to buckets, render layers, composition layers, etc. So computer graphics took advantage of the parallel nature of GPU cores. And other than the hardware aspect, GPUs are also able to be programmed through modern APIs. Also, something that has become a very important thing is real-time rendering, which is a field of computer graphics focused on producing and analyzing images in real time. And the name itself could also refer to rendering a graphical user interface or real-time interactive gameplay. Computers have been able to generate single graphics since their inception in real time, however, dealing with heavy 3D models wasn't as easy. One workaround that people used is using sprites, which are 2D images that could look like 3D graphics, and this is what they were using in games such as Doom and Blood in the Build Engine. But with one revolutionary technology such as ray tracing and rasterization, computers were able to render images quickly and they were able to do this to create the illusion of motion while still being able to accept input at the same time. Back in the days of computer graphics, what they considered real time is the ability to see your 3D objects such as characters or environments. Instead of seeing them as wireframes, you can see their surfaces, colors and textures in the viewport, but not rendered as we can see them right now, which is basically what any 3D software is capable of doing right now. But back then, the jump from moving 3D objects in wireframe to moving objects and manipulating them in the viewport as shaded objects thing was really a revolutionary thing. The next one is also very important. Texturing is central to 3D. This includes the importance of UVs, UDIMs, to PTEX. One of those is always better in some aspects and worse in others because while PTEX might be a favorite for production pipelines, using multiple UDIMs was a revolutionary way to texture your models. And it was introduced back in 2002 by Wada Digital. UDIM, which stands for U Dimension, is a way of creating a single linear number that identifies its integer block in a UV space. Simply, it is a way of extending the 0 to 1 UV space to whatever you need by assigning an offset system that assigns an image to a specified UV tile. In the early days, the value of UDIM was not fixed, but the Water Digital Texture team standardized UDIM to be equal to 10, which is what is hard coded into Mari or Blender. This also pushes the industry further with the introduction of auto UV mapping and auto UV packing. Artists now can generate really accurate and robust UV packing with a push of a button and these algorithms take into account even the textual density and how important some parts of the geometry are, which is really amazing. In the early days of computer graphics through the 70s and 80s, People were focusing on how to solve more fundamental issues like visibility algorithms and geometric representations due to the limited capabilities of computers at the time. What was possible in computer graphics was correspondingly limited. And of course, simulating the physics of the real world was out of the question. You can see an example of that from old movies like Tron and Westworld. Although if you are old enough, you may recall that CGI effects at that time looked amazing, when in fact from today's perspective, it looks really low quality and ridiculous, but back then it was the cutting edge of visual effects. Nowadays, when we talk about PBR materials, we can take them for granted, especially if you've been practicing 3D for less than 10 years. I remember during the early 2010s, artists and studios were still using software such as Photoshop to create textures and paint their 3D assets, but with the introduction of software such as Substance Painter, everything changed. And industries such as game development, were quick to change their pipelines and workflows. Generally, a PBR material is a material that closely approximates the way that light reflects off the real-world object. 
This results in materials that are not only accurate, but also look way better than the traditional non-PBR workflow, which does not take into consideration the real-world physics of lighting. That's why even in-game engines, artists use to create multiple texture sets for each lighting condition for the character and environments, as a traditional workflow doesn't allow things to look right if the lighting changed. So, a PBR material on the other hand will look realistic under any lighting and you only have to create one set of textures. That's why major game and movie studios adapted the technology very quickly. And PBR is even used when realism isn't a factor, like in those stylized Disney movies like Wreck-It Ralph because the studio realized from the start that it would save them a lot of time and make the movie visually grounded if they adopted the physically based workflow, not to mention saving a lot of time and money. In physically based rendering, there are two main workflows, metal slash roughness and specular slash glossiness. They both produce the same result, they just differ in the implementation, but in essence, to get a PBR material, you have to adhere to a few rules. Right now, software such as Mari and Substance Painter are the most popular when it comes to PBR texturing because they use predominantly a PBR workflow. Also, Blender's EV and the major 3D software are using such PBR workflow because it is mandatory and it is the industry standard in many fields. Now, talking about other revolutionary technologies, we have 3D scanning and photogrammetry. This technology is slowly but truly becoming a huge part of the future of 3D computer graphics. From movie productions to video games, 3D scanning revolutionized the way we create and use 3D models in computer graphics, especially with the rise of Quixel Library and the release of Unreal Engine 5. 3D scanning is becoming the bedrock of any CGI production, and the technology proved to be reliable even in big productions, because just recently, fully 3D scanned sets were used to shoot some of these scenes from the Netflix hit show The Mandalorian, and it looks fantastic. Now we're gonna talk about the game-changing technology called USD. USD stands for Universal Scene Description created by Pixar. This open source solution was created first back in 2010 for their movie Brave. The source code, however, was not released until 2016. The idea behind USD is to create a format that would streamline the workflow between all different production departments such as layout, animation, lighting, effects, and so on as each one would use a different software even within the same team. So their idea was to open collaboration between departments by having some sort of format to help represent the final scene between any of their applications. Some people might water down USD to just a format, but it's really more than that, because it differs from things like Lambic, as it can describe the entire scene into one file that you can export and reuse in other software, which is just incredible. Today, so many 3D software have USD support, software such as Houdini, Unreal Engine, Omniverse, and recently all of Autodesk's product lineup, in addition to others. This allows for a common language to be used between all applications, and even between studios, as this approach saves a lot of time in the production pipeline. Alright, last but not least, we have ACES, which stands for the Academy Color Encoding System. In the real world, there is an infinite number of colors, but your screen can only show a limited number of them. That's why developers came up with this color system to map out real-world value into computer-generated images. The range of colors that ACES can achieve is far better than any other system. Although it was mainly developed for motion pictures to streamline their jump from traditional film to digital cameras, Every major editing and rendering software is adopting this color system and ditching the old sRGB one. Just this year, Maya adopted the ACES color management system, which results in a far better image quality. I hope you found this video useful and informative. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. You can also watch some of our old videos similar to this one. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.